for tonight. And so we're going to look a little bit at the Gadarene demoniac. So looking in Mark chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. Very familiar story. I'm sure you've heard it. It says, And they came over unto the other side of the sea into the country of the Gadarenes. And when he was come out of the ship, that's Jesus, immediately there met him uh, out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no man could bind him, no, not with chains, because that he had often been bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces, neither could any man tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. But when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him, and cried with a loud voice, and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. For he said unto him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. And he asked him, What is thy name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he besought him much that he would not send them away out of the country. Now there was nigh unto the mountains a great herd of swine feeding, and all the devils besought him, saying, Send us into the swine, that we may enter into them. And forthwith Jesus gave them leave, and the unclean spirits went out and entered into the swine. And the herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea. They were about two thousand and were choked in the sea. And they that fed the swine fled and told it in the city and in the country. And they went out to see what it was that was done. And they come to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devil and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. And they that saw it told him how it befell to him that was possessed with the devil and also concerning the swine. And they began to pray him to depart out of their coasts. And when he was coming to the ship, he that had been possessed with the devil prayed him that he might be with him. Howbeit Jesus suffered him not, but saith unto him, Go home to thy friends, and tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee, and hath had compassion on thee. And he departed and began to publish in Decapolis how great things Jesus had done for him, and all men did marvel. Let's pray, Lord Jesus. I just ask you to be with the message tonight, Lord God. I believe this is the message that you have for each and every one of us, Lord God, myself included. And Lord God, I ask you to forgive me where I fail you, Lord Jesus, and to fill me with your spirit. Lord, be with the, the folks here tonight, Lord, that brave the conditions to come out. Lord, just watch over us and speak to each one of our hearts, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to look a little bit uh, at these uh, things concerning this man, and maybe we can draw a parallel uh, to some situation in our lives, something that uh, we might have uh, already gone through, uh, something that we might be getting ready to go through, uh, some condition we might have, or uh, something maybe we can pray for somebody else. And so we'll look at this, and, and, and uh, I believe the Lord will give us something tonight. I got six points. Number one, this man had an existing problem. Uh, he had these demons. He was, uh, he was lost. Uh, he had this possession uh, that he struggled with. He had an existing problem. Have you ever wondered why when you start maybe a new medical coverage or uh, a new job somewhere, and they look to see if you've got any pre-existing conditions. Uh, maybe one of the questions on a, uh, a form that you're filling out for an application for medical coverage is, uh, do you have this, or do you have this, or do you have a family history of this? I think the reason is because they don't want the responsibility of taking care of something that they don't have to do. Maybe they don't want the responsibility of, uh, to, to take care of something that you've already had and evidently either another doctor has not treated you or you're, you have something they don't, want, they don't want to mess around with. They don't want to have the responsibility for taking care of a condition that you already have. Maybe if you do change coverages or something comes along like that, you have to pay higher premiums. Or maybe you have to pay for extra coverage or something, something along those lines for a pre-existing condition. This man had an existing problem, and it was that he was demon-possessed and he was lost. Uh, he didn't know Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. He had all these uh, 2,000 uh, demons living inside of him. Now, I know when I was lost, uh, I probably had a demon or two, but I don't know if I could have dealt with 2,000. That's a lot of demons. And so, uh, I don't know, that, that was pretty, probably pretty rough for this guy to have all those. But, you know, we all face that same condition at one time or another. We all had a condition 
of being lost. And I, I'm looking out, probably preaching to a saved group tonight. And so you can, I can say that, that more than likely you had that condition. Hopefully you've taken care of that and uh, you've asked Jesus to save you. But at one point we all face that same condition that this man did. And uh, we might have gone to, uh, I know I was, uh, I was raised up as a Catholic. And uh, I was watching a show the other day and uh, the man, a, a man went into the confessional. And I'm not sure if anybody's familiar with it, but you, you go into this little confessional and, and the priest is sitting in another confessional. And there's a little kind of a window between that you can't see through. And you would confess your sins to the priest and the priest would absolve you of your sins. And then he would tell you to do some penance. Uh, you might have to go say a couple prayers or drop a couple dollars in the, in the, uh, the little poor box on your way out. And as this show was going on, uh, the man was talking to another priest, and he says, well, you know, only the priest can absolve you from your sins. I thought, oh, my goodness, I, I sure was mixed up when I was younger. And uh, so this man, he might have tried that. He might have went to the priest or someone like that, thinking that maybe uh, they could absolve him uh, from his sins or to take care of his demon possession. But it didn't work. Uh, we're not sure what he tried, but... Uh, I mean, in his condition, I'm sure he might have tried something. Also, I think that this guy, this, this man, by the way, uh, we did a VBS about this Gadarene demoniac a couple years back, and all the kids wanted to call him Crazy Bob. So I'm looking out. I don't see anybody named Bob in here, so I think we'll be okay uh, calling him Crazy Bob, I guess. But Crazy Bob wasn't a very happy individual. Um, we see that uh, there was some things going on in his life and the different things that he tried and different things that he did uh, that we see here uh, and having these demons, he just wasn't happy. He wasn't a very friendly individual. Nobody wanted to be around him. They sent him up to the tombs, up to the caves. Uh, nobody, nobody wanted to be around him. They wanted to get him out of town. They didn't want nothing to do with him. He probably wasn't a very safe individual. I don't think I would have uh, sent my family up to the tombs to... Uh, put some flowers on uh, grandma's grave with knowing that, that crazy Bob was up there. He probably wasn't very safe. Uh, as a matter of fact, no one could stand to have this man around. I know that when I was lost, uh, I wasn't a very friendly person. Nobody wanted me around. I, I had my own desires. I had my own wants. Uh, I probably wasn't very safe. I probably did a lot of things that I could uh, bore you with all night long that I did when I was lost that put me in an unsafe uh, position and my family in an unsafe position. And I, I can almost guarantee you that nobody wanted to have me around. And you might say, you know what, I, I kind of was in the same boat. The town people, uh, they tried to fix his problem. They tried to chain him up. Uh, he broke the chains. They put the fetters on him. He broke, his, broke the fetters. They sent him out to the caves. They, they banished him from the town uh, trying to take care of his problem. Uh, but nothing worked. I was thinking about later on in this chapter, we hear the story of the woman with the issue of blood, and it says she tried all those things, and she only got worse. And I'm sure this man was in the same boat. Tried, the people tried all these things, but it only got worse. He tried some things to deal with his problems. It says he was cutting himself, and he, you know, maybe cutting with rocks or stuff like that, maybe pain uh, to try to take care of the problems of having these demons inside of him. Uh, he might have tried isolation. He might have tried crying out, which it says he did, but nothing worked. And so here he had this existing problem. He's, he's trying all these different things, and nothing worked. And today, I'm thinking that uh, people are trying various things to deal with their problems as well. In the RU program, we deal with a lot of uh, folks that are uh, struggling with addictive problems. Um, there was a situation, I believe, either Sunday or the beginning of this week, uh, there was a 17-year-old girl in Gray Court who took her life. Uh, don't know the, all the situation behind that, but evidently she might have had some problems, and she sought a way out, and that, that's just not the answer. But people are trying all these different things to take care of these existing problems that they have. And the only solution that this man had, and the only solution that we have today, is Jesus Christ. Amen. That's it. And it doesn't matter if you're, if you're already saved and, and some problems uh, come up in your life. 
It could be financial issues. It could be marital issues. Uh, it could be something dealing with, with wayward children. It, it could be in the ministry. It could be any different kind of thing. But you encounter this problem, and you might say, well, I'm going to go to this person and talk about it. Or I'm, and they might help you out maybe in, in counseling you a little bit. Or I'm going to go to, to, to do this. Or I'm going to try this. The only solution is Jesus Christ. That's the only solution for our problem. And by the way, I was thinking <clears throat> when I heard about this young lady that uh, – that verse, it says, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 19. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. If, if all they're hoping in is this life, if people are miserable. I don't, I don't see how people can make it day to day without Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, without Jesus Christ guiding them every single day. I, I know I can't make it, and so people try to make it, and I'm glad that tonight my hope is not only in this life. Amen? but it's that eternal hope and life to come. In this man's condition with his existing problem, Jesus came to where he was. And you might be able to think back to the time uh, when you needed Christ. Uh, you might have, have gotten saved as a, as a young child. You might have gotten saved as a, as a young adult. Uh, it all depends on where you were at. Everybody has a different uh, story, I'm sure. But Jesus came to where you were at when you called upon him. And I'm glad he did that. He came to where we were. Jesus came to this man with a solution that no one else had. The, the stones, the, the cutting, the pain, the banishment, uh, the priests, the town. Nobody could help him, but Jesus came. Jesus is the only viable solution for our world today. Uh, maybe there was an opportunity missed possibly uh, with this young girl that somebody might have been able to witness to her. Or tell her about Jesus or, or ask her about her problems. I don't know. But the solution is still Jesus Christ. The answers don't lie in the arts or in the uh, uh, astrology or the different things like that. The answers don't lie with the government. The answers don't lie with anything we can do on our own. The answer is Jesus Christ. And um, I was thinking, I don't know if I've ever shared a little bit uh, of my testimony but um, I said that I was raised up a Catholic and uh, all through life uh, did what we were supposed to do. Uh, went, to, uh, went to Mass when, when the time was for that and the different things. By the way, I was teasing a uh, pastor on Sunday night on uh, Christmas Eve. Uh, we're having the evening candlelight service. And then Sunday morning, we're having the morning service. And I told him that as a Catholic, we used to... Uh, we had Sunday, or Saturday evening service, or Mass. And if you went to Saturday evening Mass, you didn't have to go to Mass on Sunday. And so we would always try to talk our parents into going on Saturday night so we could sleep in on Sunday. And he said, well, you can't do that here. We're going to have it on. you got to come Saturday and Sunday, man. But uh, I was raised up, and, uh, you know, we, we had three children, and uh, had, we had jobs, and things were going okay, we thought. Uh, we had some problems, some some addictions, and but but you know life was was going and everything was fine. I think bills were getting paid, uh, the boys were growing up. You know things things were going pretty good, and then um, and then Pam had a uh, emergency surgery, almost died on the on the on the surgeon's table, and it kind of as the saying goes, it, it kind of rocked our world a little bit. And she had some friends. By the way, this is a good testimony to the ministry of bringing food to families in need or families that are hurting. She had some friends that went to a church that wasn't a Catholic church, and uh, they asked their uh, members to bring us food for a week. And so that week as she was recovering and I was working, every night they brought us a meal. And uh, that last night the, the pastor came by, and it just I'd never seen anything like that happen before. And I said, I'm, I'm, I'm going to take my family to your church. And we went and um, still didn't get saved, but boy, it was just so new and so alive. And, and I just got hungry for everything about God. And, and uh, somebody would say, hey, they're having a revival down the road at so and such a place. And I'd go down there for the revival. And I, I was going everywhere I could go to learn about Christ, to learn about Jesus, because I, I thought I knew him, but I didn't. I didn't know him. And uh, one night we were, I went to a little church. It was called The Door. I like that. Amen. Uh, it was called The Door, and it was a bilingual church. 
And so the, it was, uh, we were living in, in California at the time, and the man would preach a little bit in Spanish, and then he would preach a little bit in English. Then he would go back to the Spanish and back to the English, back and forth, back and forth. And um, I remember they had a revival service. And I was sitting about the second or third row, and uh, the, the man that was preaching the revival, when he finished, uh, he gave the invitation, and I, I just stayed in my seat, stayed where I was standing. And, he, and whatever reason, he came right up to where I was at and asked me, do you want to get saved tonight? And I said, yes, I do. And he took me down there and, and, and led me to Christ. And I went home, and Pam was sitting in the chair, and uh, I walked in, and she said, what happened to you? And uh, I, didn't, I didn't know she knew anything happened to me. And I told her I got saved. And, uh, and then that Sunday, we went back to the other church that brought us the food, and she told the preacher, she said, I want what he got. And he led her to the Lord. Amen. And so uh, it's just been, it's just been whew, ever since, amen, living for Christ. And, and so... Uh, I'm glad that that day back in 1989, Jesus came to where I was at, came to that row right where I was sitting. That man could have just, I didn't move. That man could have ignored me, but he listened to, to what the Holy Spirit was telling him, and he came right to where I was at. And, and, and my life has never been the same, amen? So this man had this existing problem, and uh, his only solution was Jesus. And so Jesus was his everlasting propitiation, amen? That's a good word, propitiation. Basically, it means a substitute. And so here's a couple of verses, uh, and you can write them down. I'm, we're not going to turn to them. Um, by the way, I had to blow everything up, Brother Linwood. Uh, I got like 14 font over here so I can see, because uh, I can't read over here. It's too small. Uh, Romans 3.25, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. That forbearance is like long suffering. God awaited until we called upon Him to be our Lord and Savior. He was long suffering toward us. He put up with our shortcomings and He sent Jesus Christ to be the substitute on the cross for us. 1 John 2 2. And He is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And so it's not, I'm glad He saved me. But then there's, there's the opportunity that he'll save others as well. And then 1 John 4.10, Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. So he was an everlasting propitiation. In our sin-sick, our demon-possessed condition, Jesus took us in. He didn't care about the problems that we'd been carrying around for so long. He took us in even though we didn't have enough coverage. Amen. Uh, he didn't care about our benefits. We didn't have to pay any higher premiums. He took us just as we were, and he came right to where we were at. Jesus took this man just as he was. By the way, when this man, uh, let's look back in Mark chapter 5. Um, let's see. In verse 15, when the town people came back, it says, and they came to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devil and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. So there wasn't any right thoughts in this man's life until Jesus came along. I remember before I got saved, sure, my thoughts were everywhere. I, did, I had nothing to do with what God wanted me to do. But then Jesus Christ came along and put that new mind within me. Uh, there wasn't any change in this man's life until Jesus came along. Uh, there wasn't any cleanup. A lot of folks will say, well, I, I sure would like to get saved, but I got some things I need to take care of first. No, you need to get saved and allow Jesus to do the cleaning up. There was no cleanup until Jesus came along. There was no witness in this man's life until Jesus came along. And there was no salvation until Jesus came along. In Romans 5, 6, it says, for when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. And so, you know, I, if, if something's happening and, and uh, maybe uh, someone pulls out a gun and, and they're pointed, I might jump in the way of the bullet uh, to save Miss Pam. Um, but I don't know, Gary Brown, I might not jump in the way of, of Gary Brown to take a bullet for Gary, you know. Or something, uh, and you know, you might say, well, that, that's kind of a, a normal thing for a husband to do. But Jesus Christ did it 
when I was unworthy. He died for me when I was unworthy. Romans 5, 8 says, But God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He took the punishment upon himself. He took our sins and with joy went to the cross to pay our penalty. Have you ever thought about that? Hebrews 12, 2 says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finish of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. I've often wondered how you could find joy in going to a cross. Have you ever thought about that? I read a couple commentaries on it, and, and I believe I got a good solution or, or share what maybe they said. When Jesus went to the cross, he saw what his death was going to do for the relationship between God and man, and it made him happy. He knew that his shed blood was going to open up the way of salvation for men, and it made him happy. He knew that that was the only way for someone to get saved, for him to do what he did, and that brought joy to him. And that, I, I just love that tonight. I, that just brought joy. And as the author and finisher, it was the master plan from the beginning. He, he wrote it, and he finished it. He was the author and finisher. Jesus was and is our everlasting propitiation. Jesus came to this man even when no one else would. No one else had the answers. No one else cared. No one else loved him. No one else could do what Jesus did to save him. And so he had an existing problem. Jesus came along as the uh, everlasting propitiation, and he gave him an eternal position. John 14 says, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go, ye know, and the way ye know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? About uh, ten years ago, my dad died. Uh, we went out to uh, see him before he died in San Francisco. And uh, all my family was there. I've got a couple brothers and sisters. And my stepmother was there, and, and uh, he had died uh, that night. And they called us to, uh, to come back to the house. And, and they all wanted to pray the rosary. And I'm sure you've seen the, 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 the beads that are on the rosary. And you, you touch each bead, and you say a prayer when you get to each bead. And um, so they were all there uh, saying the rosary. And uh, Pam kind of looked at me and said, well, what, what are we going to do? I said, we're just going to pray. And we just, we just went to the Lord, and we just prayed while they were praying. And uh, they finished saying it. And my stepmother asked my sister, she said, there's a, there's a little prayer card on the table. She said, go get that and read it. And she read John 14, verses 1 through 5, and stopped right there. And uh, they all said, wow, that's really, that's really good. And then I don't know what urged her to do it, because my stepmother didn't like what we had started to stand for in Jesus Christ. She said, Peter, do you have anything else to add? And I said, well, let me read verse 6. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And I had an opportunity there in that bedroom to witness to my family and tell them that the only way was through Jesus Christ. And so the only way for this man to gain an eternal position was through Jesus Christ. And he got that. Jesus was the substitute. He saved this man. And uh, he had an eternal position in heaven. And if you ever thought about heaven, here's a couple of descriptions. Uh, heaven is a beautiful place. There will be walls of jasper. Gates of pearl, streets of gold. There'll be mansions, amen, not little, uh, little shacks on the other side of the hill. Uh, there'll be a tree of life with 12 different kinds of fruit and leaves for healing. There'll be a river of water of life. There'll be no more tears, no more curse, no more night. Heaven is going to be a wonderful place. But, this man had no hope of ever going to any other place than the caves and tombs. And we, too, were offered no better place in this life until we got Jesus, until we got saved. And if you're saved tonight, think about a couple things about heaven. First Corinthians says, But as it is written, 
eye hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered in the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. You can't even, you can't even imagine it, what God has in store for us. We can't comprehend it. 1 Corinthians 13, 12 says, For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know even as I am also known. We can't, we can't see it now. We, we can only think about the, the earthly things, that, that pearl necklace or that, 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 that ruby or that piece of gold. And say, wow, that's what heaven's going to be. It's not even comparable to what heaven's going to be like. And even with everything that heaven will be, even with everything we shall behold, even with everything that we're going to enjoy, I'm glad that I gotta get, I'm going to get to be with Jesus. John 14.3 says, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. That's the best thing right there. We get to be with Jesus. Revelation 22.4 says, and they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. This man received that same position the day that he was saved by Jesus. But it didn't end there. So here he was, he had this problem, and Jesus came along, and he was the substitute for him. Uh, he gave him an eternal position. But then it, the story goes on a little bit. The man had an earnest plea. Let's look at that. In verse uh, 18, And when he was come into the ship, he that had been possessed with the devil prayed him that he might be with him. He had an earnest plea that he could go with Jesus. He wanted to be with Jesus. He wanted to go where Jesus went. He wanted to do the things that Jesus was doing. He wanted to help out in the ministry. Amen? He wanted to be known for being with Jesus. He wanted to be counted among those who were followers of Jesus. He wanted people to know that he was a Christian. You know, in, in Acts where it talks about uh, the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. That was a, more or less a, a, a derogatory term. Uh, they were made fun of. Oh, those are just a bunch of little Christs. Uh, they're, just, they're just like that Jesus. They're just like that Christ. And it was sort of a derogatory term, but they, they wore it as a badge of honor, and it became known, became known as Christians. They were little Christs. When I was growing up, um, I had an older brother. He was five years older than me. And uh, they would go out and play a lot of pickup games, whether it was a softball game or a football game or something like that. And I would always tag along, but I never got to play. I was always too little. And uh, they'd, I, I'd want to play, but they, they just wouldn't let me. And I guess one day, I was maybe about 13 years old, uh, we went to this field to play a pickup football game, and they were one player short. And so they said, well, get, get Peter to come in here and play on, on, this, on this team over here or whatever. And they always called my brother Lynch. I would, they'd just, hey, Lynch, get your brother over there. And so they started calling me Little Lynch. And boy, I tell you what, as a 13-year-old to be compared to your older brother and get, get, to, get to play on the, on the football team with all of his friends, man, that was, woo-wee, that was the best thing for me. I was Little Lynch. Well, now I'm a Christian. I'm a little Christ. I get to be like my big brother Jesus, and I want to be around him. I want to do the things that he does. I want to, I want to help people like he did, and we should, that, that should be the best thing for us that we're called a Christian. These, uh, this man wanted to be just like Jesus in his ministry. I like also in Acts, it says they were addicted to the things of the Lord uh, in, first, excuse me, in 1 Corinthians. I beseech you, brethren, you know the house of Stephanus, that is the first fruits of Achaia, that they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. They were addicted to doing the things that Jesus wanted them to do. And we should have a desire to do the same things. We should have a desire to be with Jesus. We should have a desire to go where he goes or where he wants us to go. We should want to do the things that Jesus was doing. We should want to help out in the ministry. That's what we should want to do. We should want to be known for being with Jesus. We should want to count or be counted among those who are his followers. We should want people to know that we're a Christian tonight. We shouldn't hide it. We sang the other day the, the song, The Banner of the Cross. And uh, the people in the, in the medieval times or whatever, they would carry that banner. I believe it's Jehovah Nisi is a Jesus, or the, the God my banner, the Lord our banner, Jehovah Nisi. 
And the, the medieval times, they would carry that banner when they'd go to war so that when they would get out there on the countryside, people would know whose army that was. You know, it was this king's army or whatever. Hey, we should hold the banner of Christ. So when it goes up, people say, oh, that's, that, that, that family there is a Christian. That church there is worshiping Jesus Christ. That's what the banner of the cross is. We should, have, we should want people to know that we're Christians. And we should want to serve in any way we can. We should have an earnest desire to do what Jesus is asking us to do. You know, the command is there. He's given us the command to be his servants tonight. He's given us the command to, to, to go out and to tell people about Jesus Christ. The opportunities are endless. There's always someone to tell. Uh, we pulled into uh, Sonic to get some lunch today, and um, I started carrying uh, tracks in, my, in the little thing in my door. And uh, the lady that came and served us, uh, her kids used to ride the bus, and now they're grown up. And I thought she had moved out because I hadn't seen her in a long time. And I gave her a tract and invited her to come back to church. And uh, she said she's still living in the same place. And so I gave, um, I gave Jesse her address, so he's going to go by and visit the kids. And so you never know. The opportunities are always out there to be a witness, and the rewards are immeasurable. Jesus always blesses when you're out there doing what he wants you to do. And the time is now. This man had a command from Jesus to go and tell, just as you and I do. Jesus told him, go home to thy friends and tell them how great things the Lord has done for thee and hath had compassion on thee. And that's what we ought to do. We ought to go tell people, well, I'm not sure what to say. Well, just tell them what Jesus did for you. Just tell them, just tell them how Jesus saved you and that he'll do the same thing for them. Just tell them, tell them what great things the Lord has done for you. So not only did he have an earnest plea, he had an example provided. He had a testimony of who he was. Uh, he knew who he was. He knew where he was living. He knew what he was doing. He knew what the townspeople had tried to do to him to contain him. And he knew who, who was the one that took all that. It was Jesus Christ. He knew why he was changed. He knew what Jesus did. And he knew where he was going. We've got some examples that are provided to us in the Word of God. Uh, Stephen he testified to the Pharisees. Paul gave his testimony to King Agrippa. Peter preached on the day of Pentecost. And then later, even though he and John were threatened to stop teaching in the name of Jesus, they did it all the more. And so there's some examples for us to follow. We can go tell somebody what great things the Lord has done for us. We can go tell someone how, how God saved us. We can tell someone how Jesus died on the cross for us and that he'll do the same thing for them. We can reach people with the gospel. We need to be about our Father's work. He wants us to do these things. He wants us to go and tell people. We need to use the ability that God has given to us to reach those who are in the same condition that we were in. I was thinking, um, I don't know who had mentioned it recently, but they were talking about a, a godly heritage. And they were telling how some people might have come from a family of, of folks that were saved and, and, and they have that heritage behind them. He said, or you might be the first one and you're starting that heritage. And that's kind of where we fell because nobody, nobody in my family ever was ever saved. And um, Pam and I were thinking that uh, we, we kind of remembered back that she had a grandmother who was a, a strong Methodist, good godly woman. And when we told her that we were saved, boy, she rejoiced. And she said, I've been praying. And so we had a praying grandma. And so you might say, well, I don't know what to do. Well, you can pray for somebody. You can lift someone up in prayer. We can use the ability uh, that God has given us to do. If you won't reach them, who will? You know, push it off on somebody else. We don't know. Have you heard the story about somebody, anybody, everybody, and nobody? Everybody, anybody ever heard that, that story before? There were four guys uh, in town, and it was named somebody, anybody, everybody, and nobody. And there was a job that needed to be done. Somebody thought anybody could do this job. Everybody thought somebody could do the job. But guess who did it? Nobody. It says that folks moved into town and started, uh, would be a good thing to invite them to come to church. Uh, somebody thought that anybody could do it. Everybody could have done it or should have done it. And guess who went and invited them to church? Nobody. And somebody could have told someone about Jesus Christ as the way to salvation. Anybody could have done it. Everybody should have done it. 
but nobody did it. And it's kind of a sad little uh, story, but that's the situation in a lot of places today. You're always thinking someone else is going to do the job that we need to be doing. And so we need to get out there and do it. Even though uh, the townspeople knew who this man was, even though they knew what he was, had done and where he was from, uh, he went anyway, and he began to publish his testimony. Uh, I believe he got into the track ministry, amen? He gave out an excited proclamation. In verse 20 it says, And he departed and began to publish in Decapolis how great things Jesus had done for him, and all men did marvel. He went out and told people exactly what Jesus had done. He was obedient. He was told how he was lost, but Jesus found him. He told him how he was blind uh, with sin, but now he could see. He told him about the salvation uh, that Jesus brought to him. He told him about his eternal home uh, that was promised to him in heaven. He told him that Jesus was the only way. He told him that Jesus loved him. You know, we can, we can tell people, there are a lot of folks that, that need someone to love them tonight. We can tell them that Jesus loves them. He told them that Jesus cared about their every need. And we know that some people listened. Some people even believed. Here's a couple of verses I'm going to try to tie in the end here. In the beginning of Mark chapter 5, it says, And they came over unto the other side of the sea, into the country of the Gadarenes. Then the miracle took place, and the man was healed. And then the people came, in verse 17, and it says, And they began to pray him to depart out of their coasts. So he was there on the other side, in, in Gadara. And then the people said, Hey, we don't want you over here. We don't want you to leave. And then in verse 21, it says, And when Jesus was passed over again by ship unto the other side, much people gathered unto him. I believe he left, and then I believe he came back. And this time when he came back, they received him. And we see later on in, in chapter 5, we see that Jairus came and asked for his daughter to be healed. We see the woman came with the issue of blood and had a desire to touch the hem of Jesus' garments. Uh, these folks might have heard what Jesus had done to this, this man, this crazy Bob. I don't know, but I know that when people heard his testimony, the Bible says all men did marvel at what Jesus had done. He was obedient to what Jesus commanded and we should be too. Jacob, you come and, and play an invitation. Maybe tonight uh, you've never been saved. I don't know. You know, you, you know, there's a possibility there's someone here. Maybe tonight you have a plea that only Jesus can answer. Maybe tonight you want to tell others what Jesus has done for you. Maybe you want to be a stronger witness. Maybe you want to start carrying some tracks around or uh, witness to your co-workers. All you need to do is ask Jesus to show you how. And he will. This man had no clue on what he was going to do for Jesus. But Jesus told him. And the man was obedient. He did what Jesus told him to do. You know, all we need to do tonight is to be obedient and do what Jesus told us to do.